Okay, so it's a party. Yes. But about TV. Yes. Join us every Monday for TV Party, where we'll talk about the news of the moment, the best episodes of the week, and what we can't wait to find sitting on our DVRs. We'll also chat with actors, writers, and experts about TV, elect classic characters to our Hall of Faces, deep dive into full seasons of some great shows, and more. Find us at Consequence of Sound, iTunes, or wherever you procure fine podcasts. Oh, Clint, one more thing. Is it open bar? It's BYO. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Uh, go ahead and take a moment right now to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, wherever you're listening from to keep up with these as we do publish uh, multiple interviews every single week. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today my guest is my friend Greg Dooley of the Afghan Wigs. We're gonna be talking about the album 1965 that came out in 1998, celebrating its 20th anniversary this October, and we take a deep dive into it. In fact, we'll talk about the, uh, the, as he calls it, the darkness on both sides of recording the record. That was a good experience while they were doing it. So there was depression that led up to it, and there was a band breakup that happened right after it. In fact, he gives us a very haunting tale of why he thinks that all happened afterwards that has to do with some, uh, well, a, a grigri bag down in uh, New Orleans. He also tells me about working with Alex Chilton. Uh, then we uh, get to the present tense, uh, talk about the loss of his guitarist, David Rosser, which leads into a very frank discussion on death and life and the memory of our friends afterwards. Uh, there's an update uh, on what we should expect from Greg Dooley next, working with Mark McGuire, though he does call the Afghan Whigs an ongoing concern, but I had to ask him also about the Gutter Twins as well. That's all in here. We'll start out talking, though, about Aretha Franklin. It's Kyle Meredith with the Afghan Whigs. Hi, Kyle. So you doing all right? Really good. A little sad to be living in a world without Aretha Franklin, but... I'll, uh happy she's not in pain anymore. Yeah, I thought that actually might be a nice place to start. I figured you'd have some uh, some nice things to say about Aretha, um, the big soul fan that you are. And uh... Well, my mom used to listen to Aretha when I was a kid. So she was a voice that I've known since I was, before I could talk. And uh, just, you know, amazingly comforting. And, and, you know, I used to like, you know, I'd watch her on interview shows and stuff. And, and she just seemed like someone that I would like. Like just a beautiful person, you know, kind of from my just up the road, just up I-75. You know, Detroit people and Cincinnati people, yeah, we mostly get along, except <laughs> you know, around baseball time. Yeah. But, you know, she has that moniker for a reason as the queen. Absolutely. And, you know, had worked with great songwriters, worked with great producers. And, uh, I mean, really, dude, that voice, like her ability to inhabit a song, you know, like taking songs from the people who wrote them even, you know, like with uh, respect off the top of my head. Carol King. Carol King, Burt Backrack. Uh, I mean, as much, as much as I love Dion's version of Say a Little Prayer, uh, Aretha owns it, you know, like just full on. Like it, it was strange when I saw when I saw that she passed. It was the first song I thought of. When I saw that she had passed away, I uh, say, say a little prayer is it's just a uh, kind of a perfect song and a really a, a, a song from deep in my childhood. Uh, you know, both hers and the Dion Warwick version. Yeah, but uh, massive loss. But uh, but what a mark she left. Yeah, I, I was I was happy that um, I, I guess we got a little warning going into it, and and not for us, but but for her because a lot of times. You know, with, with Petty, you know, that that was so sudden. And, and then all the tributes, you know, had to happen afterward, obviously. But but knowing that her friends were calling her and that she was able to talk to them in, uh, in whatever way, uh, I, I imagine that it was also getting to her that all these tributes were already in motion, you know, and, uh, and the outpouring was kind of happening. Sure. Well, I mean, you know, probably not many as beloved as Aretha Franklin, you know. Right. Like, uh, uh, around, around the world, old and young, like, I mean, she's... She did nothing but good things, so that's quite a legacy to leave behind. We'll use that as a, a, a bit of a, a seg into the uh, the main topic here, and that's I wanted to call you about uh, you know one of the Afghan Whig records, uh, 1965, hitting its twentieth uh, anniversary uh, this year, and I 
think it's maybe in October, if I remember right. You know what? I'll bet you that is right. We yeah. recorded the record during the winter. So, yeah, it usually takes, I think we finished it in, I want to say we, we were still messing with it in May. So May, June, July, August. So, yeah, five months. Yeah, that's we did. We worked on it because we wrote it in New Orleans. Everyone, I, I was already living in New Orleans, and the rest of the band rented a house, and we worked on it like it. We built it really from the ground up in in New Orleans. It's it's probably good to to kind of start with you know the the stuff beforehand because people have said this is when you finally landed on that soul sound that maybe you'd been searching for for a while i've always thought also thought of it as as one of your your poppiest records there there are songs on here that's that's very very uh, accessible in a pop sort of way but but when i look at the backstory of the times leading up to this that's almost surprising that this record sounds in anything like that because from what i gather it, it wasn't a good time in, in your life going into this record Go, you know what right before it was not but I was actually treated for depression before I I went back down to New Orleans. So I was actually in a in a in a very good place at the time. But I began to acquire vices that would cause me trouble years down the line. A turning point in a lot of ways. You know, it was, it was out of the darkness into the light. But it was uh, it wasn't much longer till I was back in the darkness. But at the moment, it was really like kind of. I mean, we were kind of living like the rolling stones down there like you know like i mean that it, it was we were having a great time so probably the most fun i've ever had making a record yeah. uh just in terms of like rock and roll debauchery and uh and being in a place where you could comfortably do it you know so uh it's definitely you know i mean it it, it has there, there there is a darkness in uh in, in pretty much all my stuff but this has the 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 brightest lights in it too i think like some you know some like a song like something hot or 66 or city soleil or just off the top of my head crazy mm-hmm. you know like they're they're they're, they're really pretty melancholy free you know what i mean like they're joyful even at times you know what i mean was, so uh was that like a reaction uh, against all of that because I, I besides the depression i mean i when you left the record label you, you lost a drummer around this time I, I read that you had to do a lot of this record maybe from your own pocket you know to pay for it so were these bright sounds just sort of a a big reaction against whatever had happened previously i, I think probably i mean we were free you know, we we had uh, I did pay for the record, by the way, but I had I had no doubt that what we were about to do was going to, you know, pay me back. So that, I, that, that there wasn't really any kind of, oh, no, I'm, you know, I'm driving my car off the cliff. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, once we got it started and started having a good time, I mean, it, it was I, I think, you know, the initial intention was to kind of make a party record and freak everybody out. <laughs> You know, the original title of the record was Stand Up to Get Down and honestly, probably a better title. But uh, <laughs> um, we 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 ended up uh, settling on 1965. And I can't tell you how many people come up and tell me they love 1969. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm like, I love it, too. But that's by another man. <laughs> Missed it by four years. <laughs> you know, yeah. But thank you. So really, yeah, I mean, but again. A great time. I had I had I had been down there uh, for uh, like six months previously, working on the first Twilight Singers record, which didn't come out till much after that one. So I knew the town pretty well. I, that's when I met Henry Butler. That's when I met Kermit Ruffins. That's when I met Roderick Paulin, who ended up doing all the horn stuff on on all the records, like kind of writing the horn part. Steve Myers was around all the time. Susan Marshall came down with her husband, Jeff, who engineered the record later on, and she became a big part of the record, too. So it was all very kind of family style, you know, but again a really good time there was there was darkness on both sides of the record but during the making of the record it was pretty bright i have to say the uh the sexual confidence is different too because you know, that's always sort of been a part of your lyrics in, in some way or the other it sounds like it's different on this one and maybe because it's what you're talking about the mood of down there because there's, I, I think there's more 
bravado in the come on lines that's happening throughout the uh, the record? Well, it's I mean, it's the great thing about songwriting is you can create a new person and you can be that person for three or four minutes. So sure. I was enjoying being several of those people. <laughs> <laughs> and what a place to do it in. Sure. Yeah. We brought up 66, and, and I think that one really centers on, because when, when you listen to that guitar part, and I'm not the only one who said this, like at that moment in time, you're like, that could have been a Backstreet Boys song, just with it, if it had a different vocalist melody and all that stuff on it. But like that seems like when I listen to that song, and I love that song, by the way. I love that song. Thank you. But there's, there's something about it going, man, if you were ever shooting for the top of the pop charts, you know, that, that was the one. There, there, there you go. And it was really strange, like, I, that, the, that the record label didn't kind of get that. You know what I mean? I kind of swung for the fences uh, on those songs, probably for the last time. I think I kind of retreated back into my darkened room after that. Yeah, I mean, I thought, I thought there were a couple of hits on that record. I honestly did. And uh, um, and I thought 66 was one of them. 66, crazy, uptown again, something hot. John the Baptist were all like big up tempo. All of side one, really. You right, know what I mean? Right. Isole, like uh, I mean, it, it just it, it's it's very infectious and 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 super fun to play. So uh, uh, on any given day, it could be my favorite record that I that I've ever done. Yeah. And John the Baptist, by the way, that might as well be your sympathy for the devil or, or gimme shelter because it's otherworldly the way it sounds. You know, it, it doesn't sound like humans created that song, or at least the way I hear it. <laughs> wow, well, thank you. I, lo I love John the Baptist and the uh, having that horn section and having Susan sing on it with me. I mean, when you have, when you have that much power behind you, there's nothing you can't do. And I think that uh, like we mixed a record with um, George Draculius and David Bianco, who just passed away a, a few months ago. And they, I, I, they really, really understood the dynamics of that song and, and did an excellent job yeah. mixing it. I never knew this until just like the research of this record, but uh, Alex Chilton, is he somewhere on this record? Alex Chilton sings the vocal harmony on Crazy. Wow, I did not know that. Oh yeah, like big time. Like play, play it and you'll hear him. He's it's plain as day. It's it's you know it's it's Alex Chilton. It's, it's he's the only guy who can sound like that. You know he made me sound good, like I said. And he was uh, yeah. I I hung out with Alex uh, quite a bit when I lived down there. Yeah, and this was sort of before the whole when the world finally started catching on in 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 real. I I think because of the '90s, it was still sort of a what I call a handshake band, you know, the secret handshake, like, oh, you know, you know, Chilton, you know, Big Star. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I remember, like, I, I, I had, the letter was one of my favorite 45s mm -hmm. uh, when I was a boy. And uh, when, I remember when I started hearing about Big Star and that he was that dude and, and that he, and that he was like 16 when he sang the letter is very Steve Winwood, you know, like right. very child prodigy, like a like a, a dude who sounded like a kid who sounded like a man, so uh, a kid who sounded like a black man, right. a white kid who's like a black man, you know what I mean? So, but uh, yeah, man, I uh, Alex sings on on uh, Crazy and uh, and and Joe, uh, Jody Stevens, Big Stars drummer, sings on uh, on Now You Know on Gentlemen. So. Uh, I sang, I, I sang with half of Big Star. Yeah. You just called him up and asked him? Is that, you, you sort of had that in mind or what? I had it in mind, and Jeff Powell, the engineer, knew Alex from Memphis. Jeff Powell lives in Memphis, and he, he knew Alex and called him. And uh, Alex came over to the studio and, and listened to it. And I'm going to be shocked if it wasn't one take or two takes. He just, he did it. He he did it immediately. He knew exactly what to do, and uh, um, it, it, it was phenomenal. Yeah, what a moment. What a moment that must yeah. have been. Not a question here, but I'll also throw in, uh, it makes me giggle every time I hear you kind of whisper that who's hot, who's not part. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thank you. That's a great little uh, I moment. Loved, I, lo I loved that song, man. I, I loved the... Uh, I loved the the Mace, Puff Daddy, Biggie, Diana Ross jam. So uh, Mo Money, Mo Problems, I believe is the name of the, right. of the song. Loved that, and, and always, you know, always love ad libs. I, I used 
I used a bunch of Outcast ad libs on uh, Powder Burns, the Twilight Singers record. Oh. So whenever I go listen to Forty Dollars, it's like you know I'm I'm practically dry humping. Hey, uh, <laughs> uh. do you do do you do those moments live too? Do you like like do you drop that puffy in still? Um, I have. Don't we don't play, don't play crazy a lot, but uh, and sometimes I would and sometimes I wouldn't. But you know, anticipating the reaction, I, I, I'll do it. I know how people dig stuff, and I'm like, and I dig it too. So I would absolutely do it again. Yes. So the, you, you're talking about the darkness on the other side of the record. I mean, this was the final one for a while. It was after this you you all sort of broke up. This. The, did you see that the end was on the way at all? I, I actually did not. But when I got, I had a, a um, there was an incident down in Austin, Texas, where I got creamed in the head after a show by these guys. And that was sort of the, the end. The, the, the one, one thing, I'll, I'll give you a story about 1965 that probably no one knows. And Steve Myers, who sings on the record, my Dear beloved friend, sings with a group called Mighty Fine in Brooklyn right now. But we, we've been we've been pals since Black Love. He and I were walking down, I think, like Dauphine Street in the French Quarter, and this Haitian woman was walking down the street. And like you know, we just you know, I think I'm sure we probably started to say hello to her, and she shook a gris gris bag at us and said something in French and walked away. And we were like, whoa. That didn't seem friendly, you know what I mean? It mm-hmm. seemed really strange. And and long story short, I got conked in the head, and five months later, Steve got shot six times in uh, up in uptown in in New Orleans. So I don't know, but I, I've always felt like whatever was in that gree gree bag, we had to uh, had a price on it, and both of us had to pay it. So man. That's there you go. That's a rough little yeah. That's that's a rough moment. Uh, yeah, I mean it was. I mean, but I, I'm I'm just saying it because I, w- I was thinking about when I knew I was going to talk to you. I'm like, I'm going to tell Kyle about the green green bag. <laughs> you know, uh, it's uh, um, yeah. They have have rarely told anyone that that fact, but uh, but that's a fact, and and I'm I'm pretty sure that there was that w- those were the those were the respective consequences. Right. All right, that's yeah, that's amazing. That's interesting. You know what? And and again, this is maybe sort of an awkward pivot. And I want to move closer to the present for just a moment too, because you know, as we're talking about the darker sides and, and death, uh, Rosser, who passed away, uh, I guess a year ago now. How how did, how has that affected whatever you're doing moving forward? Like, have you all started on whatever the next phase is, and and with that in mind? Oh, of course. We're a very show must go on gang. You know, mm-hmm. and 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 I don't think that Dave would think we would we would stop. You know, like if you've ever lost someone close to you, it's you know it's always profound and kind of hard to put into words. But I find that the best way to uh, remember and keep someone's energy around you is to to keep them in your heart at all times. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I just, I, I'll, I'll just, I, I have random thoughts about Dave Rosser every day, every day. I'll just think of something funny that he did or some way he smiled or, or whatever. But like, you know, I've, I've had three or four already today. You know, he was, he was absolutely one of the closest friends that anyone could ever have. And, uh, you know, to me, he was, you know, you know, he was like, uh, like a soulmate to me. You know, like when I met that dude, I was like, wow, you are, I've known you for thousands of years. <laughs> you know what I mean? So in that regard, you know, uh, uh, you know, not unlike I'm sure the, the people, you know, up with Aretha when passed on, it's, you know, it's your family and your, and the people that you've influenced, whether that be, you know, in your community or on, in, in her case, in the universe, you know, it's the, you know, whatever you the energy you leave behind, I, I think, I think stays forever. Yeah. So. My friend Charles, just the other day, he had lost some family members, and we were sort of talking about a similar thing right there. And he said the most beautiful line. He said, um, he goes, you know, you don't really ever die until the very last person who remembers you has also died. Because, because of that, your energy, your memory is still around. It's still being used, you know, it's in some way. Well, sure. But there's also, I mean, don't, you know, like... I don't think that ever really dies either because think about like 
a story that someone told you about someone that you never knew, but you know their name or you know that you were the friend of the friend. I, 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 I think that also keeps people alive, you know, like, uh, and I do, I mean, I just had profound recognition of people that in my life that, that, that it makes it seem like I, you know, I encountered them on another plane somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've thought that since I was a kid, like, you know, whatever deja vu is, whatever, you know, whatever these things are, it's, it's the, their coincidences or, or their remembrances of, of something that you either already did or haven't done, right. you know, but, you know, I mean, we we could uh, we could take a deep dive into a metaphysical ocean right now if we don't watch out. Yeah. Right, that's entirely true. Um, I, I'll go ahead and then ask you about uh, if you, if you kind of know what's next. You know, as far as the next step, I know there's there's been some there's been a couple one off singles since the last record, hasn't there? No, nah, there was. We just did. Uh, we did. Um, you want love? Oh, that was uh, it. The, yeah. the, the the pleasure club song. Uh, we did that. That uh, that was sort of like. You know, Dave Rosser and I had talked about doing that forever, and we knew James, who wrote the song, and James actually sings on the song. So uh, that was special, and I, I know it was special for James because James loved Dave, and, and we all, it was just a way to kind of honor our friend. And uh, the Afghan Wigs as a collective, we, I'll tell you how we've made the last couple records. Like, we get together in New Orleans two or three times a year, sometimes four. And for like a week or 10 days and we work stuff up and we put it in the bank and, and then everybody else is working on other stuff. I'm working on, I don't know if you know, uh, Mark McGuire. Uh, he, uh, was the cu- guitarist in a group called Emeralds and right. has made several amazing solo records. He's in, he's downstairs in my studio right now and we're working on some, uh, some stuff of our own. So, uh, I think everybody's kind of, I think we're going to take a little break. The wigs, like, we're, I know we're getting together in December for our, you know, quad annual meetup. But uh, I think we're all, I think, I think, I know a couple of us are going to do, do our own thing for a little while. But, uh, but you know, I mean, so, uh, let me just say without any, you know, so to remove any ambiguity, the Afghan wigs are an ongoing concern and, and, and shall be until we tell anyone otherwise I, we're just we've gone pretty hard the past you know since since we got back together you know we've done three tours in uh, uh six years and uh three world tours in six years and made two records so i think i think we uh i think we all deserve a little not do that <laughs> for a minute you know i've uh, <laughs> i've honestly enjoyed those records too they you know I want to say they, they sometimes sound like gothic period of the band more so than you've ever done. And maybe that's the iconography that goes along with the artwork that kind of paints the picture of the sound that I hear. But I've loved the mood of these records so much. And they're some of my favorite songs that you all have done. Thank you. You know what? And, and us, too, by the way, like and, and, I, and I have to say that we're lucky enough to play for a group of people who come to watch us play and they let us do what we want. We'll always throw, you know, we'll always throw other stuff, but we're, you know, like just, just being some kind of like, you know, jukebox band, just never wanted to be that. And you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. the, on, the only way I was ever going to, you know, sing for the Afghan Wigs and again was if we had new material always and always cranking new material. So the next time the Afghan Wigs play, because we just played last weekend and uh, that'll be it. That'll that'll be it for a while. I don't think anybody's keen to go on tour for a minute, a hot minute. Yeah. But when it happens again, I don't know in what in what form uh, I, I I will appear in. But I've always got something cooking, Kyle. I'll tell you that much. Well, I saw a picture of you in Lanigan, which I know is you know that happens from time to time, and I think there are fans out there who would love another Gutter Twins record somewhere down the road. <laughs> I think there'll be a Gutter Twins record somewhere down the line. But make no mistake, Mark Lanigan is the hardest working man in show business. Yeah, I and that. that guy that guy has a solo record already in the can. He just the amazing Duke Garwood. And I know he's gonna be he's doing a record with his wife too, which I've heard some of that and it's fantastic. So no one has a, a heavier dance card than Mark Lanigan. <laughs> and uh, you saw a picture of me because as I always do, I come up on a song or two on Mark's every time he puts them. And, uh, and it's always, 
it's always a thrill because I love his songs and I love to sing with that guy, man. We sing really well together and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's fun to, uh, fun to sing with him. Well, I always look forward to anything you put out and I'll continue doing so. Uh, I, I'll actually only wrap it up by saying um, I realized that the most recent people I talked to and who I'm about to talk to in the next interview, you all, you have connections, I think with every single one of them because uh, today I just posted an interview with Wayne Kramer, which I believe you'd been, I, I, I love Wayne. Yeah. And if I'm not if I'm not in his book, um <laughs> And then uh is it uh Mark Arm? I just talked to him earlier from Mud Honey, which the you know that, that's love Mark Arm. Yeah, the sub pop connection there. And then tomorrow I talk with uh with Ani, Ani DeFranco. So please give Ani my best. I will. And and I'll tell you what, I was actually somebody was, was uh somebody brought that up to me uh that didn't know it. And they were like, Hey, did you sing with Ani DeFranco? And I'm like, I've sung with Ani DeFranco a lot. <laughs> but uh she sings on I think three songs on Powder Burns and one song on Dynamite Steps, or maybe two. So please give her my best. She is one of my favorite people. I will absolutely do that. Absolutely. Okay. Greg, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for the conversation here. I, I loved having it and for the music, and uh, and we'll see you around at some point. Always, always a pleasure, Kyle. Have a great day. Viva Aretha. Hey, big thanks to Greg Dooley of the Afghan Wigs for that call right there, talking about that record, 1965. Can't wait to hear what comes next from him. Hey, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening from right now so you can keep up with these interviews. We put out about three or four weeks, so uh, it's a, you, you want to keep up with us. In fact, if you're listening to the podcast version, uh, either at iTunes or Podchaser, wherever you're getting it from, uh, we would love it and be so grateful if you would give it a rating. And if you're uh, so inspired, leave a review as well. After that, you can head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern, where you can also find some bonus episodes of the series. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.